Okay, my name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the uh, CEO of a medium-sized, small uh, tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist, uh, and I have been uh, studying uh, disinformation or low-quality information uh, that's been coming out in our media in certain cases. The case that we'll just talk about today is the Ron Paul campaign, where all the media outlets on the same day adopt the same talking point. There are There is now a top tier of candidates, and then they named off uh, three, uh, which was the first, second, and fourth place people, um, and omitted Paul from the discussion. Uh, and there were all sorts of vicious attacks that I'm not taking them seriously. So it appears that the uh, nod from the top down is discount him, call him wacky, don't take him seriously, don't give him airtime, assume he doesn't have a chance, uh, and then every once in a while uh, give him a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, space because he's got a good demographic. Okay. I don't really see a big difference between Romney and uh, Obama, so uh, I don't think that the uh, powers that be really care that much. So uh, what we did w to try to figure out who owns the media, what are their interests, I'm not uh, claiming that I know exactly how all of this came about. And where we ended up in this investigation of the media, basically, is... Um, we, oh, come on. Oh, yeah. Okay, there we are. Okay, so these are the media companies. Uh, they're all owned by larger uh, entities, which makes it harder to influence them. They're basically all sandwiched behind conglomerates. And then here are the six huge private equity firms that have the most invested in these companies. Um, and so then what we did is we found out that they were also the same ones that were involved in the military industrial companies. Uh, which I will show right here. Okay, so these are the companies that do business with the government. It's about 125 billion total, and the military is more than half of it. So in terms of contracts with government, more than half is military. And if you say follow the money, that's pretty creepy. Okay, but they don't stop there, these companies. They also use the government to sell weapons to other countries. The government places every sale. It's called foreign military sales, so that it's not between the military contractors. So we found out that these same investment firms have interests in both the media and the, uh, the war industries. And so to make some kind of sense out of that, uh, we tried to look at their ownership, but we found that each of them, like this is BlackRock, has holdings in each other and they have holdings in the underlying companies below the companies below that so to try to make sense out of that we have to look at the people because it's impossible to untangle uh, the stock transactions because they go round and round and round you could have uh, it's fantastically complex uh, so the irony of course is that uh, publicly traded corporations with all their transparency rules are in fact controlled by players that are more nebulous and many of which are private equity uh, which means that uh, the people actually are pulling the uh, levers are much more anonymous than the companies they control beneath so it's a perversion of our transparency laws to have private equity having vast enormous stakes in all of our corporations this right here is probably a third of all the equity in stock in the United States, just with these six companies. Um, and it might be higher. I still haven't counted all up. There's around four or five trillion in the NASDAQ. So there's probably a th nearly a third. So the, the, these private equity companies, ultimately, all this has to drive back to people who actually own the, the money. It's all traceable to people. So here are the, uh, the small group of rich and powerful people. And um, we looked at the Forbes 500 list, but getting back to this model of uh, this uh, military industrial complex and media complex um, and how they relate to these six companies. Well, in corporations, uh, banking, finance, defense sector contractors, overseas business development and reconstruction are all benefit, all benefit from uh, the public sector power structures. Um, getting involved in uh, what we could call disaster capitalism. Uh, so if we go into a new country like Libya or Iraq, uh, 
We're able to suddenly monetize all their assets through our banking and finance. They become part of our financial system, directly or indirectly. We can inventory what's in their countries, uh, whereas uh, they were socialists before, we could not. Uh, then uh, we have the defense uh, 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 contractors, <clears throat> uh, and obviously uh, they benefit from a corrupt link with the public sector for uh, warfare. Um, and then they also have a uh, often sell more weapons in these foreign military sale contracts that the government brokers than they do to the government itself. Um, and we'll get into that tonight. And then there are these conglomerates that often have interests in both the defense contractors, such as General Electric and the media company. But these private equity uh, companies that concentrate all the shares make it very easy for you to not show that you might have conflicts of interest because you just put all your shares into these guys and they basically control the entire economy. Um, and then when we looked at the Forbes 500 list of people, we found about a third of them were neocons that were hard right. Uh, about a third seemed to be centrists like um, uh, Warren Buffett and then other, harder to make out. Um, so that's where we left off. Uh, then the pressures on public policy that create corruption and problems is APAC. Many of the media companies originally founded by Jewish people in the entertainment business and who went on to be extremely successful in owning huge media conglomerates. And they do support a U.S. forward policy in general in the Middle East as part of their support of Israel. There are some exceptions, but this creates a big problem with our attempt to drain the military-industrial swamp uh, that is strangling us and taking away our liberties. And then the lobbyists allow the government uh, officials to essentially have a uh, liquidity in their uh, cash flow of servicing these guys. These three guys all benefit from war and they all have investments into the media outlets. Uh, so the, uh, now this is just facts. There's some uh, uh, speculation here as to motivations, but these are all facts. These are industries that are invoked in this disaster capitalism mode. So now getting back to the uh, media companies. Let's see here now. The work I've done today, uh, let's see, is it very accessible? Well, I think the best way to show you is to go here to, um, all right, so these are um, the countries um, that I've been studying that are allied to uh, various powers for armed sources. You see, if you are reliant on Russia for your armaments, you bought all your advanced systems from them, if you piss them off, you could lose the ability to operate your armed forces. So these are very serious matters to buy proprietary, advanced, expensive weapon systems from other great powers. So we invaded Afghanistan, so they buy from us. We invaded Iraq, they buy from us. Uh, Saudi Arabia buys from us. Egypt buys from us. Uh, soon Libya will be, of course. Uh, Turkey buys from a mixture of different Western exporters. They have a little bit from every Western country. They take advantage of their NATO position to have much more advanced hardware, uh, assuming that Western hardware is superior to Russian and Chinese, but more expensive. Okay, so now what we look at is countries that primarily import from Russia, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, India, Iran, uh, Vietnam, and uh, most, uh, they have the largest penetration into Africa. And then we can look here at Indonesia, and um, they uh, import from China, Russia, Europe, and the U.S., and Japan is our other ally. So that's going to come in handy later. So let's walk through this. A foreign military sales business. <clears throat> so what I did here um, is I looked at our arms exports. So here's the U.S. arms exports. There's almost, I guess to give you a sense of proportionality, here is our arms exports in 2010. Almost all of it to the Near East. Western Hemisphere, a half a billion, but it's 18 billion to the Near East and 6 billion to East Asia. Africa was a measly 22 million. 
So Africa does not import its weapons from the United States. So when we do a strategic map of Africa, we're going to expose uh, its real alliances because weapons source is where the buck stops. So um, uh, so Asia is uh, the uh, where uh, and the Near East, Middle East is where all the money is spent on U.S. arms. Um, but India uh, imports 82% of her arms from America. Pakistan has many more contracts, as far as I can tell, with China than the U.S. Burma, definitely with China. Um, and uh, so at any rate, <clears throat> uh, let's see here now. The next thing I wanted to show you is, so here's the U.S. export. So our main countries are Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. And then we sell a fair amount into uh, Western Europe, a few countries here in Africa. Uh, as you see, these are amounts as little as $100,000. The biggest blue amount is a million. So these are very tiny purchases, whereas this is from 1 to 10 billion, the red ones. Australia, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Egypt, and um, let's see here. Also, uh, Canada is in the uh, higher range. Um, and um, so uh, this shows how much uh, uh, is going on in our economy and who our primary targets are. And it's ironic that we're pumping arms like crazy into the most volatile region in the world, uh, if you didn't happen to notice. Okay, so getting back. Uh, so here is who exports what to who. So the U.S., Russia, China, and Europe all are exporting. Latin America is just a tiny, tiny amount of the market. 3% for the U.S., and 2% for Russia, 2% for France. So, um, you know, it's under half a billion, the whole market. Africa uh, is 23% uh, of China's exports, about 100 million. And it is 9% of Russia's exports, about 250 million. And then um, uh, we've got Asia, uh, which is 22% of the U.S.'s exports. 13% of UK's, 39% of France's, and 62% of Russia's. Um, now that means that we're exporting the U.S. around 3 billion in, and Russia is exporting around 3 billion in. And then uh, China is pushing in another 300 million. And then here's the net importers. This is interesting. Okay, so this is Latin America, I see. Uh, mainly Amer U.S., Africa, almost entirely Russia and China, uh, Asia, uh, mainly the U.S., uh, and then uh, North Africa and the Middle East, mainly the U.S. So, um, okay, and then here are the countries that we've sold the most systems into, UA, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iraq, Australia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, so you can see why we didn't unseat the Egyptian military, perhaps, since they're 5% of our arms exports. So in Japan, Israel, uh, Korea, Jordan, Malaysia. But uh, right in around here, we start no longer being the primary supplier, probably. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see here. I think that just about does it for that portion. So um, thank you, and good night, and good luck.